I hate it today because here we are, the greatest tag team of all time in the history of wrestling. And we lost out on so much. And welcome back to Dark Side of the Ring Unheard, the podcast from the Hit Vice TV series where we plunge into the Dark Side archives to uncover real revelations from some pro wrestling's most storied characters, which have until now never been broadcast. I'm Jack Encarnacio from the Lapsed Fan Wrestling Podcast, joined by my Lapsed Fan co-host, J.P. Sorrow, as well as Dark Side of the Ring's executive producer and co-creator, Evan Husney. Don't forget, Dark Side of the Ring hits the airwaves again coming up on Tuesday, 10 p.m. Eastern Time on Vice TV as part of Season 5. And Evan, we're here on Unheard to talk about Animal of the Road Warriors, uh, real name Joe Laurionitis, of course, along with Hawk. Uh, they were the legendary tag team known as the Legion of Doom and the WWF, the Road Warriors, just about everywhere else internationally, Japan. These guys were you know, one of the most uh, insane box office attractions of the 80s in the professional wrestling business. And you sat down with, with Joe Laurionitis to talk about uh, that story and some of the untimely and unfortunate twists and turns that it took for season two of Dark Side of the Ring and the episode The Last Ride of the Road Warriors. And it's fitting in some ways that we look at Animal ahead of the upcoming next episode of Dark Side of the Ring because it's an episode on a similar 80s powerhouse tag team specialist, one might say in some ways, uh, who met an untimely demise, much like Animal's partner in crime, Hawk, did, in the form of Terry Gordy. Uh, lots of, um, well, what could have been in both of these stories. So first tell us about the Terry Gordy episode we have coming up on Tuesday. That's right, yeah. Uh, season 5 continues with the Terry Gordy story. Uh, uh, much like with Animal, which we're going to get into in the Road Warriors you know, Jason, the my co-creator uh, with the show here, huge fans of the Road Warriors, but also always have been a, just a massive Terry Gordy fan. Um, primarily, obviously, his work in the Freebirds is, you know, legendary and uh, very storied and <laughs> all the exploits of the fabulous Freebirds. But we're also huge fans of Terry's work in Japan. And I think this episode definitely... Uh, takes a lot of its runtime to spotlight his career over there. Uh, not only as a singles wrestler, but also as a tag team performer uh, with Dr. Death Steve Williams, which is my favorite tag team name of all time, the Miracle Violence Connection. That's right, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, Terry's story is, is fascinating. He started wrestling as a teenager well before he could you know, drive. He's in the ring wrestling. And of course, he joins the Freebirds and has that whole ascent. Um, And as you said, he's a powerhouse. To watch him in the ring, especially in Japan, is really awe-inspiring. And uh, but unfortunately, you know, he has a pretty tragic uh, sort of incident that occurs with an overdose on a plane flight um, that sort of uh, really took away his personality. And so, for the last several years of his life, he was sort of living as almost a shell of his former self. And that's it's it's pretty pretty heavy, especially in how it's covered in the episode. Um, his kids, uh, Ray Gordy and Miranda Gordy, are in the episode, as well as a lot of his colleagues, and you get to hear from them, you know, talking about the best years of Terry Gordy, the legendary years, and of course the most difficult years as well. So, um, really, really, this this is an episode that we're both, you know, Jason and I are super proud of. I think it came it came out great, and so very excited for people to check it out next week. Yeah, that, that's that's excellent. What what a what an interesting uh, snapshot of you know the the perils and the excesses of the '80s, and just also you know stardom so fast. I mean, Terry Gordy was you know pegged for a main event stardom before he was even 20 years old. I mean, the the guy got started wrestling before he probably even should have legally, uh, but he was such a big guy, uh, so physical of such great physical stature that he was able to project credibility really from the second he stepped in to a wrestling ring, even as a teenager. And, you know, he goes through that period of the 80s. You mentioned the Freebirds, World Class, the Von Erichs, just an incredibly heady time to to be in his position in the business and these massive crowds and the sort of like heartthrob element to the audience that, you know, this teeny bopper kind of thing that the Von Erichs had going on. It was hard to uh, turn away from the excesses and hard to turn away from, you know, the, the pills and other things that kept you going and, and moving. And uh, in a lot of ways, that's what Animal Watched happen uh, to his partner, Hawk. Um, and as you guys sat down, 
this is of course uh, years ago for season two to talk about the story. It's almost like Animal is, is sitting there watching uh, somebody just run away with the the narrative and the story of of his own career. In a lot of ways, the Freebirds also similar similarly defined by the downfall of, of Terry Gordy. Yeah, the Road Warriors episode is was a very uh, personal episode uh, for me in in a couple of different ways. One huge Road Warriors fan as a kid from a you know from being five years old, you know when they had had their early '90s sort of run in the in the WWF. Um, I was a huge fan from the what is that WrestleFest arcade game? You know where they're the end bosses. Of course. Uh, you know, huge huge deal. Um, I actually have a cabinet of that behind me. And also just, yeah, being, you know, the Wrestle Buddies, the action figures, the Hasbro figures, huge part of my uh, of my childhood. Just these larger than life sort of heavy metal, you know, uh, warriors. Uh, it just, just it captures the imagination as a kid growing up in that era. Uh, and then, of course, as I got older and watching, you know, videos from them in the territories, the sort of pre-WWF days, uh, especially in the NWA or WCW when they're coming down those light up stages, you know, that like those like stairs that are you know, with the lights coming out of the stairs and, uh, and to, to some bootleg version of Iron Man by Black Sabbath. It's an incredible visual and that's just in- amazing and which we recreated in the episode, of course. And, um, but again, going back to, you know, when they're in the territories and they are using Black Sabbath's Iron Man and they're coming out to that and you see the crowd reaction and the pop as they always talk about, it takes your breath away, man. It, it is one of the great entrances of, of all time in terms of, in terms of wrestling great pairing with an amazing song and an amazing visual of a tag team love that and uh, the second reason that it's also very personal to me is because i grew up in minneapolis and these guys are you know staples of the minneapolis wrestling scene you know especially with all the robbinsdale folks rick rude mr perfect you know uh and so i i i you know growing up in that area it was always very personal to me you know and, and there's a lot of hometown pride and the fact that these guys were, you know, Minneapolis St. Paul guys. And um, it was a really cool experience making this episode because we did something very unique, which we've never really done before. Because all of the key players that are interviewed in the episode, you have uh, Paul Ellering, you have, uh, you know, obviously Animal, uh, Scott Norton, and so on and so forth. Eddie Sharkey, you know, uh, all those guys are Minneapolis guys, and we all brought them into town. You know, they all kind of came in together and we all came together in Minneapolis at the same time to sort of film this interview, all their interviews in succession. And then, of course, as you see, there's a couple shots in the episode where they're all kind of together sitting around a table, almost like a proto Tales from the Territories thing, which we would do later. Um, But so that was a very special experience, just kind of reuniting everybody and getting everybody in the same room again, um, because that's something that hadn't happened in years you know, it hadn't happened in so long for them to be together. So that was really special. And so I have a lot of fond memories making this episode. Obviously, you know, we lost Animal shortly after it aired, unfortunately. Um, But again, just super grateful that we were able to get his interview and tell the story, you know, of course, before that. Yeah, yet another example of unheard sort of locating these interviews that were done with folks that, you know, seem timeless when you sat down with them. But sure enough, the episode airs and a couple of years later, we lose folks. And these interviews that sit in the archives suddenly take on more gravity because it's some of the last high profile sit down interviews. A lot of these legends uh, did JP. He mentioned did Evan, um, you know, the Legion of doom run in the early nineties, WWF. Of course they were massive stars in the AWA and Minneapolis in, in the mid eighties and the Jim Crockett promotions territory, which went on to become WCW in the late eighties. Just speak if you could to what made the road warrior special. I mean, they just, I guess I should start off by saying, well, absolutely. Um, but they, uh, <laughs> they were so, I mean, this is okay. Let me explain my situation with the road warriors, because here I am a fan starting out to be a fan in late 1991. So I see this team and I see them as the tag team champions of the WWE. And I think they're absolutely incredible. And these are monsters and they're just they're just so cool and they're so strong and they're so like, they're just badass fighters. And I had no clue to me. They were brand new. I didn't know who they were. I didn't know that they had uh, oh, like a decade's worth of, of history in the business. 
And so I was just pretty excited about them. And then you find out they were in WCW at some point. The reason I found that out was because I got WCW, the video game, the Nintendo mm-hmm. video <laughs> game. And that like, World like championship wrestling. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And, and so to see them in there, it just added a whole different layer uh, uh, to them. And one of the most devastating things of my, of my, my childhood, my 10 years there, my, my uh, 10 years old was when they lost the belts to the fucking money incorporated. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? They, they, they couldn't get beat by the natural disasters and they're getting beat by these scrawny little crumbs <laughs> that from the very beginning when when ollie anderson first broke them into the business as talked about um in the documentary on dark side it was like they came out there and they were buzz saws like there was no consideration for their opponents like these guys looked like space alien killers and they were going to go in there and run over just about everybody and they became massive box office attractions because everyone agreed that even though there were some sacrifices along the way in terms of other guys stature uh, this was the move because these guys had to be these these huge ass kickers, and then yeah, JP, you see they they fall to a tag team of lesser physical stature, and it it, it did it didn't necessarily um, add to the uh, the the aura. No, not at all. It actually it it it, it hurt it, and it, and 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 it that you know when they they were gone and in in late in mid ninety two, and and you know, and I've told you this, Jack, but you know when they came back. In 1997 to the WWE, that was one of those weird moments. And I had no idea about TV ratings and, and, and who was better than who. But when they came back in, in the spring of, or, or, or late winter of 1997, I was like, oh, the, the tide is turning. Well, they were, they were people that you remembered from your childhood, all of whom seemed to be in WCW at the time. In fact, they were in WCW right. in 95 again. And, uh, well, fortunately, they did get that time in with natural disasters, so we could get that wonderful line from Hawk on one of his famous interviews. What, what did he say, JP, again about the natural disasters? I believe it went something like this. Natural disasters! You like to throw your weight around. Well, that's okay. We like to throw your weight around, too. <laughs> what a rush. What a rush. I mean, and the episode gets into... Becoming the Road Warriors, which is brilliant because you don't just snap your fingers and have a, a tag team, especially that that's the marquee attractions, both in the United States and in Japan, that the Road Warriors were. There's there's a process where, you know, you, you discover that guys sort of carry the charisma and the potential uh, to be this kind of world beating tag team. And then there's the process, right, Evan, of making it happen. And that, that was a hugely important uh, thing for us uh, in the episode you know, <laughs> being such fans of the shoulder pads yes. specifically uh, as as kids, as, as as such an important prop of, of, of wrestling. Did you have one of the, the little ones, the, the fake ones? That oh, they had? yeah, of course. Like, like, like the foam ones you get at the at the at Yeah, the they had like the plastic pads like the. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and those were such a huge part of Jason and I's childhood. I mean, we didn't you know, he grew up in Canada. I grew up in Minneapolis. Uh, we were worlds apart, but we were, we were into the, that exa- the same era, the same thing, and it was it was it was the Legion of Doom. That was a huge part of our upbringing, and uh, so for us, it was super important to get very forensic <laughs> about the creation of those shoulder pads and and the characters. And that we'll get into it too. The face paint, the face paint, and everything. It's like kind of breaking down almost uh, like you would see, uh, you know, in a making of. Uh, a eighties movie, you know, how, like how, how they created the masters of the universe characters or whatever, you know, it's, 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 that was that important to us. And of course, you know, we took some liberties uh, there uh, with like, you know, shots of animal with like a, you know, like a sander or like, you know, sparks flying as he's sharpening the, 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 uh, the spikes on the shoulder pads. But I mean, you know, that just was our imagination with that. And, you know, it's also something too, it's like that I really appreciate, which is, you know, they are like, obviously, you know, bootleg kind of reimagining bootlegs of, 
you know, road warrior or that sort of post-apocalyptic pastiche that was so ubiquitous in the 80s with movies and, you know, drive-in movies and so on and so forth. And so um, I love that about wrestling. I just love the idea of, you know, especially Memphis is very infamous for this. And of course, Japan, this idea of doing this sort of bootleg version of a pop culture phenomenon, of course. And I, I'm, you know, I love Leatherface in Japan, you know, and Freddie and Jason, Jason the Terrible in Puerto Rico. I love this idea of sort of being inspired by what's happening in film of that era and then sort of mate wrestling having its own version of it. And, and these guys just are at the top of the list of that for sure. So how does uh, Joe Laurinaitis become animal? Well, of course the, the road warriors and Legion of doom were always billed as being from Chicago. Um, and of course, Minneapolis, as, as Evan mentioned, is where they, you know, came up in the world and, and were discovered uh, bouncing in clubs as, as the episode gets into uh, to get ushered into the business. So associated with those two cities, Minneapolis and Chicago, but as, as uh, Animal told you guys, he actually grew up in Philadelphia, and that's where his whole sense of hard knocks uh, came from. As an inner city kid, he, he remembers living not far from the train tracks that are depicted in Rocky, and um, he remembers um, you know, his father, who was uh, a guy who worked for the company Honeywell, and so they moved a lot. Uh, they, there was some time in Tampa, there was time in Chicago, there was obviously um, the end is in Minneapolis in terms of where they settled, but his, his earliest interviewers... Uh, his earliest, pardon me, memories in the interview are, are of Philadelphia. And um, he said he grew up in a jock household, as a matter of fact. His dad was uh, an, All-Ameri- an All-American in college at LaSalle, uh, he said, and um, a pitcher. Um, and was drafted, as a matter of fact, by the Pittsburgh Athletic Club, as, as he referred to it at the time, um, and a couple of other baseball teams. So he grew up in an athletic household, a hard knocks household, and, and was an athlete um, in his own right. And every day was a fight. Every day was a fight, and so I think he's sort of drawing the inspiration to carry himself like the tough guys the Road Warriors were from, from, his, from his earliest days. Well, man, you're an inner city kid. You're seeing things that you're, you shouldn't see as a kid. I mean, you know, you're, you're forced to grow up faster, you know? I remember coming home from school one day and hearing that my one of the kids I used to hang around with, you know, stabbed his mom 13 times. I was 11 years old. And he was like, he was 13 himself. You know, you hear things like that. You know, you get a bike for Christmas, you take it out, and in five minutes, kid two doors down is hitting it with a ball-peen hammer and bending all your fenders. You know what I mean? And that's the kind of stuff, you know, with the last name of Laurenitis, too. You know, someone was always calling me out, call me Laurenitis. So, of course, back then, you fought for your honor, and I got in a fight all the time. We got in fights constantly. And that's, JP, what the audience was asked to feel about the Road Warriors, right? That these guys were constantly just fucking people up in, in, in an environs like animals describing. Oh, God. I mean, that, that, that's, that's exactly it. I mean, you, th- there, were, there are very few people who, uh, in the modern day of wrestling, like, and I'm talking about 80s to now, who really got across the idea that they were hurting their opponents. I mean, you know, I guess if you were in a war games match with Hawk, it, chances are he was hurting you. <laughs> While I would certainly appreciate if I was wrestling with them, them to be, uh, you know, a little bit safer. I can't deny the fact that their aggression is, is the most appealing thing about them. And the fact that they no sell shit and they, they, they just, they're just intense. They're so intense. and. It's amazing how simple a thing is like not getting beaten and beating other people and no selling. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, now you guys are money. Huh. I wonder how that happened. Right. I wonder, right. I wonder if that just always works. And that's like something in wrestling that can always be called upon. I mean, you see Goldberg and, and so many other acts that's, that thrive that way. Evan, uh, when you sit with Animal here, when you sit with Joe Laurinaitis, it comes off like a guy who's seen some things. Yeah, totally. And I just remember thinking doing that interview at that time, we were we were in a gym somewhere in Minneapolis where we where we framed the the shot there. I can't remember exactly which gym it was. Um, but I just remember thinking, you know, there's so much material in this interview. I seem to remember this interview going on for a very long time. And I think it's a three parter. Yeah. In terms of the transcripts. Not not to say you sat with them three separate times, but it was a long day, I remember, and, and thinking, man, this is this is tough, uh, and this is going to be tough to 
encapsulate in this episode. And I kind of realized in hindsight, like if I would have done this episode today, you know, learning what we've learned about making these shows, maybe I would have not to take anything away from animal. I'm glad that we interviewed him and, you know, we tried our best to tell the story of the road warriors. I may have emphasized, uh, the episode a little bit more on Hawk, uh, and, and, and maybe frame the episode that way. Uh, because there was just so much material, and and again, I, I'm as hearing as with all these you know podcasts we're doing, I'm hearing these back again and totally recalling, you know, that moment when he was is telling these parts of the you know these parts from the interview, and um, similarly to animals upbringing, you know, Hawk's upbringing. I don't know if you if we're going to play any clips regarding that, but you know, Hawk's upbringing too is very unique and bizarre. Like it's almost like a Jeffrey Dahmer, like sort of, you know, fascination with like dead animals and collecting bones and skeletons and, you know, weird stuff. Like he was a freaky kid, man, um, who also got into fights all the time. And so it's interesting that, that these two guys would, um, would, would link up. Yeah. They kind of were able to draw from authentic life experiences. Well, Animal ends up in Minneapolis. In the episode, he talks about how he met Hawk at a gym training. Um, you know, he's lifting and Hawk comes over to him. And and then they just bought into, uh, you know, being linked at that point. They just hit it off, essentially. And um, Animal recalls a guy named Kevin Kelly who wrestled in the WWF. His nails was in was on, around that scene as well, working out. And you had uh, Barry Darso, who was Smash and Demolition, who I think is in the episode as well, right? Yep. Yes, Barry Darso. Again, another Minneapolis guy. That was, uh, I can't remember if he, if he currently lived at the time, but yeah, it was, he was part of the gang that we all, you know, united in Minneapolis. Yeah. Barry's great. Great guy. Very good. Uh, good, good inclusion there as well. Um, you have Scott Norton, you have Rick Rude, Kurt Hennig, Nikita Koloff, the Beverly brothers, all of these guys that went on to uh, John Nord, who was the berserker in the WWF. All these guys were all from the same, just like workout community in Minneapolis. It, it's just so remarkable. And a lot of them, as as Animal talks about, um, end up getting jobs bouncing at a club called Grandma Bees in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. And uh, Grandma Bees was a strip club by day and like a, a multi-genre music hall by night. And with all these notable wrestlers around in that kind of environment, as uh, Animal talks about it, it gets predictably wild. If anybody were to come to the door and they would have any bike jackets on, you'd say, hey, man, your colors have got to come off. And if they proceeded to give us any shit or a hard time with it, we'd go up in the office and have a little bit of a discussion. <laughs> and the owner of the bar would pull out his freaking his, his, his 38 or his, or his 45 or his 9 millimeter and point at the guy and say, listen, man, you take them off or you're leaving. You know, it, it, it was it was a pretty pretty crazy. It was owned by an Italian family, and it was it was pretty no nonsense bar because it was a big bar. There would be twenty five hundred to five thousand people in there at any given weekend. Because downstairs during the day was believe it or not a strip joint, and then at night it was pool tables and country bar, and then upstairs was rock and roll. So you had such a mixture of music fans. And so on any given night, so we all start working there and, and we would work, uh, Hawk was funny, man. He and John Nord, we, and, uh, I was one of the escorts for the girls going to do the wet t-shirt contest <laughs> and, you know, Root and I were, Rick Root and I were, and then, you know, Hawk and John Nord would be the MCs and pouring the water on the chicks on stage. You know, it was just it was just <laughs> funny for us because we would just have a great time with it, you know, and, you know, pouring water all over her boobs. <laughs> oh, my God. I can almost hear the gears turning in your head, Evan, as he's explaining this scene. You had to recreate those Grandma Bees days. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I can picture Grandma Bees in my head, like the exterior of it, you know, driving by it so many times as a, as a kid. I can perfectly wow. picture, picture the place, of, of course. And, uh, yeah, definitely something we had to bring to life you know their idea uh, you know the idea of them being bouncers uh he he also mentions i think we included in the episode if my memory serves me correctly is that they also worked as sort of debt collectors you know for you know connected folks shall we say um and something that animal and others also talked about with hawk was how like this dude had connections no matter where he went 
he was running with, you know, shadier folks on the other side of the law. Even in Japan, the Yakuza took a liking to Hawk, and he was always getting mixed up in the sort of, shall we say, organized crime types all, all over the place. Like if they were in Brooklyn, they would be going to, you know, some of these kind of, you know, mob heavy hangouts and they all knew him and they all liked him. And, um, and so that was kind of this weird theme that kept popping up with a lot of the interviews we did about Hawk, but it does also go back to the days where I think these guys were roughing people up, you know, uh, who owed money to certain folks. And that was something that they were also doing in addition to the, uh, bouncing at grandma B's and, 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 and other bars, uh, you know, in downtown Minneapolis. JP, could you imagine going into grandma B's in like 1981? And you see Hawk and you see Animal and you see Rick Rude and you see the Berserker and you see Smash of Demolition. I mean, before they were anybody like there's got to be people that saw all of these guys before they became television stars. Just going to this bar. Of course, of course, there were people there and I would be probably horrified to see that many, you know, that much beef in, in, in yeah. one place that is in a butcher shop, you know, <laughs> like it's been a marvel in my mind how many professional wrestlers came out of that that area just mind-boggling you mentioned uh, eddie sharkey um evan eddie sharkey was a longtime minneapolis area wrestler a contemporary of Vern Gagne's, and somebody who trained a lot of guys he would basically scout around as as would ole anderson who was a minneapolis guy himself i think he's uh wisconsin born i think or he, he ended up settling in wisconsin whatever he's he he knew minneapolis extremely well and at the time he was uh, booking georgia championship wrestling down in atlanta which was uh, really the first uh, wrestling signal to go up on on satellite cable coast to coast in the United States on Ted Turner's WTBS and was the forerunner to world championship wrestling and all of that. And uh, coming up later on in in this season of Dark Side, there's going to be a look at a moment there called Black Saturday, where Vince McMahon actually buys that whole operation right out from under Ole Anderson. But uh, but Ole and Eddie Sharkey knew how to scout the Minneapolis area bars for bouncers that had charisma and muscles that they could push and gyms where the power lifters would gather together. And, you know, Scott Norton was a champion arm wrestler. And so his reputation was well known in the city before um, he trained to become a pro wrestler. So this was just prime picking for guys that were out there trying to find marketable pro wrestler potential uh, and being able to spot it with the naked eye. And, as Animal told you guys, Eddie Sharkey was a character. Um, <laughs> he'd get them in there training in this, you know, enclosed, freezing cold room uh, in, in the ring he had where you hit the ropes and you hit the wall, you know. And uh, he just... It's a church basement, by the way. It's a basement in the church. That's right. That's right. Church basement. That's right. And so all these guys that would become massive, nationally famous professional wrestlers are in here learning the ropes. And Eddie Sharkey sitting there saying things like, yeah, Joe, Mike, Rick, you look great. Barry, good, good. Tackle. You know, drop, kick, whatever. So he's sitting there. He never got out of his chair, according to Animal, because for a lot of the time, uh, Eddie Sharkey was dealing with a hernia. Animal told you guys. So he would just sit there <laughs> yeah. and just yeah. dictate verbally what they should be doing. And that was supposed to be enough to teach them how to become uh, professional wrestlers. Um, and, and so th that's, that's the scene. And then once a week, once they had gotten their reps in, in terms of, you know, learning really basic fundamentals of how to move around the ring and stuff, these were just power lifters and bouncers after all. Uh, he would actually put them to the test in a unique environment. He would have these wrestlers plow their wares. The first time anybody would have seen Hawk or Animal uh, trying to do pro wrestling, um, it would have been some inner city kids from Minneapolis. Listen to, to this story. Now, let me tell you something. You get a little group of little Hispanic and some little black kids in there, they will tell you if you suck in a heartbeat because they would look at it and say, you guys suck. You know, yelling at us because we want them to be bluntly honest. How I mean, we didn't know what it was going to look like, if it was going to be good or bad, and how we could make it better. So, and, and Ed would do that. He would put those. He would put on a show once. Uh, that was his deal with the church because it was in the basement of the church. Imagine seeing the Road Warriors. It's just this kid at a church in Minneapolis, and they, they look like they don't know what they're doing, and and they're being told they suck by these kids that are daring them to fight them. It's just, uh, <laughs> it's just such a. It's such an ignominious way to start what would become legendary wrestling careers. These guys just taking that abuse from kids. I love it. And, 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 and Eddie Sharkey is such a character and he, and he was when we put him, you know, in this episode, uh, you know, he, again, a guy that goes way far back. He's actually in the, 
we actually interviewed him for the Harley race episode, which is, you know, coming up here in season five uh, as well. So it was great to catch up with, with uh, Eddie Sharkey. But one of the craziest, weirdest things was when we got to his house and we're looking for places to film and asking him if he has any memorabilia or any things we can film, photos, scan, you know, things we can do for the show. He didn't have a whole lot. And I remember he's like, oh, I got this thing over here. And he opened his uh, he opened his closet and he had a Ribera Steakhouse jacket, Uh-oh. You know, his 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 Ribera Steakhouse jacket from the 80s that he got. And it, of course, didn't fit him anymore because he's lost a lot of weight since then. And uh, and he's like, uh, do you want it? Do you just want it? And I was like, uh, sure. Are, yeah, you, are you sure? Yeah. No, come on. No, you can't. No, he's like, no, I insist. You guys are great. You're super nice. And. Yeah, he just fucking gave me his Ribera Steakhouse jacket, which I still have. Just like, yeah, here you go. Oh, you want it? Here you go. Ribera Steakhouse, for those who might not know, is a famous steakhouse in Japan that all the wrestlers from America would go to eat at. And they've got, you know, pictures all over all the walls over there of the famous wrestlers. And they only gave the jackets out to select few. It's not like you can just walk in the gift shop and get one of those. Right. That's what I was going to say. And, and like, I don't really wear it because it's like, you know, stolen valor. Right. You know, so I just kind of you know appreciate it in my closet. <laughs> so thanks, Eddie. So they become the Legion of Doom, uh, well, the Road Warriors, and as greatly sort of delineated and illustrated in the episode, they're starting to get comfortable with what this look is going to be. Um, at first, Animal goes down to Atlanta by himself as just the Road Warrior, and he kind of looks like one of the village people. Let's be honest about <laughs> it. Yep. Does he really? I, I don't. I don't have any knowledge of this. What did he? What did he dress as? He just had like you know a leather hat and chaps and like a choker on and and like Daisy Dukes. Daisy I think. Dukes. Yeah. He's he just you know. Yeah, he was trying to figure out what a road warrior was. And there wasn't, yeah. there wasn't really a face yeah. paint component. There certainly weren't those badass spiked shoulder pads yet. He hadn't innovated those, you know, coming off the idea of the shoulder pads, you know, he'd wear as a football Kind of like new wave sunglasses, I'm kind of thinking. Something maybe. like that, sure. It's like a new wave sunglasses meets like, like kind of confused biker look, maybe. Yeah. Very uncomfortable feeling. And what I love is this, this, um, this picture he paints in the interview he did with you guys where they're going to the Georgia Championship Wrestling television tapings, which took place at the TBS studios where they shot all kinds of things for the TBS station, not just pro wrestling, but the ring was in there. But it was also offices that TBS staff and people who worked there nine to five, Monday to Friday uh, would also uh, use. But on the weekends, the wrestlers would come in and, and do the live television show. And I just love this description that Animal gives you guys of what it was like sort of figuring out the look, figuring out all these props they got to bring and, and going to this just it's not a big time arena. It's not even an arena. It's it's a it's basically an office park uh, to shoot what would be um, the platform that would first make the Road Warriors uh, nationally famous. You gotta understand, we we arrive in um, on Techwood Boulevard there in Atlanta, Georgia, right at CNN Studios. Now, there's no locker room because it's studio tapings. So we're in there, and it's the you know, like the, the Starship Enterprise type of uh, thing they had, you know, for CNN at the time. And so we got all our wrestling gear hanging on the Star Starship deal and the big CNN dish and all that. And, you know, we're looking, we're looking at it and saying, man, I, you know, because we didn't have cable. You had to go to like a restaurant or hotel to get cable TV back then even, you know. And uh, But we all knew of uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling. So, and here we are in there, and we're dressing in, like, cubicles where people are doing their business all day long. And so they had to hate us after we left because we probably just left in a pigsty, even though we weren't supposed to. You know, guys with tape and everything else you're doing in the wrestling business, you know, we had the face paint that got all over the place at the time. But, uh, you know, we go in there, and, uh, you know, it, it, and it, it, it was surreal for Hawk and I because it was like, Man, here's all these mega stars of Georgia Championship Wrestling and around the world. And then here we are now. Now we're a part of this. And in our first match, I think all the nervous energy, uh, I'll never forget this. We, we, Hawk hits the guy with the clothesline and then he dives out of the ring behind me. I said, What are you doing? You got to go cover the guy. And he dives from the floor <laughs> over the second rope and covers the guy like a splash from the floor. And covers the guy one, two, three. That's how nervous energy we are. We were we were so 
unorthodox that it worked perfect. I don't know about you, JP, but I absolutely love clueless road warriors. Just a couple of muscle heads <laughs> dressing in a cubicle and forgetting their cue to make the cover. I, I think that that's I think that that's absolutely what wrestling is right there in a nutshell. It's dressing in a cubicle and not knowing when, how, what is a cover brother. He mentioned the paint, the classic Road Warriors face paint. Plenty of discussion in the episode on Dark Side about the gear, how the look came together. Uh, Animal Off also offered great detail in the episode about how he came up with the signature spider. That would be kind of the centerpiece of his face paint ensemble and how he came, how that came to be. Evan, when, when, you, when you interviewed him, did you ask any questions? Because this has always been something that I've found to be one of the more bizarre aspects of being a pro wrestler. Being a pro wrestler, you obviously have a signature look, you have a hairstyle, and you know you can't really live the rest of your life without that hairstyle. Vader and Hawk obviously had very, the similar, the same haircut. And in, in Wrestling with Shadows, he talks about, Vader talks about being you know, in real estate. Right. And like, I'm sorry, but if I'm another you know, realtor and I come in contact with this clown and he's got this fucking double mohawk i ain't doing business with him like was there any discussion of the fact that they had to live their lives like this did they care was there an impact you know i can't quite recall what the sort of you know day in the life of the haircut is but the um the one thing i do remember which i believe is in the episode and of course we had to just make some ridiculous reenactment of it which is you know, I think Hawk had, you know, because he's an eccentric cat, man. I mean, he was far out. You know, his concepts for shit. I mean, it's, it's all in the promo. You know, when you hear his promos, you know exactly what wavelength the dude's on. But anyway, I think it was his idea for the haircuts, the look of the haircuts. And it was the idea that, you know, his haircut is the inverse of the mohawk. It's the inverse of animals' haircut. And so if you were to, like, plug them in together, brother... They would they would fit be a full full head of hair. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, okay, you know, and of course, you know, we did the most impractical like their heads bowing and joining (laughs) sort of reenactment version of it. But yeah, I mean, something I've definitely wondered, too. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, fucking Peter Gabriel had to have that haircut, too, when fucking 70s as well. So I don't know. Yeah, it was part of being a wrestler. You know, you spent most of your time in the gym and wearing Zubaz and hanging and banging. And yeah, like, that's all you're doing is just zoo, working out, Zubazing, you know, and I'm sure you're wearing, I'm sure you're wearing like a Zubaz hat too, you know. Zubaz hat, muscle shirt, Zubaz pants, sneakers, Halliburton briefcase with all your payoffs and other things in there. Fanny pack, Rolex. Gimmicks. <laughs> Gimmicks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because yeah. I always think about, you know, I can think about Tatanka. You know, Tatanka had to walk around with that red streak in his hair. You know, did he want to live with that streak in his hair all the time? Or, you know, like, eh. <laughs> He had a couple streaks going. That's true. He did, actually. Um, <laughs> so he talks to you guys about a moment where they actually meet with Vince McMahon at the beginning of their career uh, about coming into the WWF kind of they're still precocious young guys and and Vince is 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 realizing the buzz they're building in the AWA in like 85 and there's a meeting that Animal talks to you guys about where they went up and visited with Vince at his house and had a good conversation and you know they said you know we, we've got a guaranteed contract that we're working on here and Vince came back and said well we, you know at the WWF all I can do is offer opportunity and <laughs> now that goes <laughs> so they they take the guarantee and stayed with, at the time, it wasn't the AWA, it was actually the, the NWA slash Jim Crockett Promotions. It was kind of like an early overture to the Road Warriors before they would actually come in, in in 1990, as we've been discussing. And shortly after that was the birth of Demolition. Yep. And, uh, you know, everybody knows about Demolition. JP, they're sort of like, uh, oh yeah, you know, most people are, are comfortable acknowledging that it was the WWF's attempt to basically replicate a lot of the things that were money about the Road Warriors. The aforementioned Barry Darso in there. You know about... I assume you knew about demolition at the tail end when you when you got to know about uh, the Road Warriors. But thoughts on that sort of a uh, simulacrum of the Road Warriors <laughs> that were the uh, the demolition. I'm, uh, demolition is one of my all time favorite tag teams. All time favorite tag teams. I've lo- always loved Demolition. Thought they had the greatest theme music. I thought, you know, I never actually, as somebody who started watching when I did again late 1991. I never put two and two together that they were like demolition was a knockoff of them. 
Yeah. When, when you hear Animal tell the story, Evan, I don't know if you would agree, but did you think of Demolition as a knockoff of Road Warriors? When I was a kid, it was just, you know, more of that, you know, <laughs> it was just, it was just like, you know, the, like the fact that we had both was a good thing, you know, <laughs> that we had yeah. both of these sort of spiked, you know, warlord. And you also had the powers of pain. And I mean, they, you know, to me, are more of a ripoff. They literally looked like the yes. Legion of Doom. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a good point. And, 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 and that, but they are sort of like kind of, you know, whereas we were saying road warriors is kind of the bootleg of the road warrior. And then, you know, demolition right. is kind of the bootleg of the, of the, of the road warriors. Um, so it's, it's, it's a funny <laughs> sort of, you know, uh, dichotomy there, but I, yeah, I mean, I was a huge fan of demolition too. I always preferred the road warriors, but still also a fan of theirs. And Animal talked about how when they came into WWF, finally, how excited they were to get programmed against Demolition because in their minds, this was the feud to do because everyone knew that Demolition was a ripoff of them. And when they got there, they did program them together, but it wasn't for any extended period of time. And Animal ended up sort of disappointed with the amount of business that he was able to do with his, with his old Minneapolis buddy, Barry Darso, as they kind of uh, went on, you know, to divergent paths. And then there was a falling out between Demolition Axe and WWF and some lawsuits. So... You know, you don't even see demolition acknowledged by WWF and like the Hall of Fame or anything because of how that ended. So uh, a lot of different twists and turns there. But what could have been? Um, but, you know, eventually, you know, well, let's face it, the drugs set in and the sharks start to circle and they get involved in, you know, being pro wrestling superstars and a lifestyle. And, and what one thing that Animal said that I thought was a really interesting insight, he, he talked about how in, in the drug culture at the time in the business, when you were a top guy, you found that the people that sometimes were encouraging you to party the hardiest were the people that didn't necessarily want to party with you, but they wanted to see you fall off. They wanted to see you party so hard so they could move in on your action. And then guys are, ju- are dying to jump in your shoes too. So the same guys that were, oh, hey man, you're the greatest. I can't believe you could do that many lines of this or my lines of blow, right? Or you, I can't believe you could smoke that much pot. I can't believe you could drink those 50 shots of friggin' vodka were the same guys that were trying to jump in your shoes. So they weren't really your friends. <laughs> they acted like your friend. They tried to befriend you, but they weren't really your friends. Because if they were your friends, they wouldn't let you go down that, that path, right? What a business, huh, JP? When it comes to employment, the wrestling world is the most dangerous place <laughs> in know. the world. I know. Everyone wants your spot. You want the other guy's spot, but you don't want to give up your spot. And you're afraid that everybody wants your spot. And it's absolutely hilarious to me that, that there, there is so much fear and paranoia that, that especially of, 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 you know, guys from this, this era, this ilk, you know, there was that, I feel like it's not as bad as it was i could be wrong maybe i'm just being naive well we know animal was able to sort of stand at a distance or at least now in looking back on it stand at a distance and realize kind of the manipulative aspects of what uh, fellow wrestlers were engaged in when they encouraged the road warriors to party and well you know animal did party it was hawk that took the cake in that category and and if you're looking for someone to, to victimize with that agenda mike hegstrand hawk was was a good target for that and of course as we all know the lifestyle absolutely got the best of the sort of manic Mike Hegstrand over the years, and pretty soon he's completely unmanageable. In well, I mean, who climbs up a Titantron drunk? <laughs> yeah, well, we'll get there. They dramatized it, if you want to call it that, in the years to come. But uh, here's the story from Animal of what it was like uh, for his fate to be entirely intertwined with a guy who, as wild as Animal may have lived, never could have matched Hawk in that category. I'll never forget. There used to be a, a place in Cincinnati called the Drawbridge Inn. We stayed at it. And I, I get a tap on my shoulder one night. Animal. Hawk's trying to go swimming. The pool's closed. Oh, no. And it's a night of partying. Put him to his room. Hour later, the, bar, the, bouncer, or the security guy comes down again. Hey, Animal. Hawk's trying to go in the pool. He can't go in because down here again, I'm going to have to call the police because he can't go in the pool. This time, Henry Godwin takes the back. Take him to his room, get him undressed, get him in bed, and 15 minutes later, he's dressed back downstairs. That's just, he, Hawk was 
God bless him, was Mr. Congeniality, man. I mean, he had the biggest heart in the world. He would give you the shirt off his back, but he had that one Achilles heel, and that was, he, he won at the party, you know, and that was it. It wasn't that he was a bad guy or he was an asshole. He was a great guy. He just liked to have a good time. And if he was having a good time, he wanted everybody around him to have a good time. That was the way Hawk was. And it kind of cost animal, didn't it, Evan? Absolutely. I mean, he, he does talk about in the episode, in the final version of the episode, he talks about how uh, their identities are linked, you know, the, the, like you know, who they are in wrestling, you're dependent on the other person. You know, you're, you're sort of dependent on, you know, being able to rely on your tag team partner because that's who you are. You know, if something happens to, to Mike Hawk, if something happens, then it's going to affect his payday and it's going to affect his whole thing. And um, that's a bizarre life of a tag team wrestler <laughs> in that way. Um, and one thing I do also remember about spending time with Animal just came back to me kind of when I was listening to that. And I want to be respectful, obviously, because, you know, Animal chose not to share this on the interview ultimately. But I, I, I you know, and obviously that was his decision. But when we were talking about doing this episode together. Um, you know, I was a huge fan of the Road Warriors, as we've talked about. We've talked about a lot. And I actually met Animal uh, in, a, in, a, in a bar at a wrestling event uh, just randomly. And he had seen the first few episodes that we did of the show. And I just said, hey, man, we're fans. Let's do an episode together. And he was like, hell yeah. And we started putting it together. Like he's, he hooked us up with everybody that you see in the, in the show. And so it came together that way. And we were, when we were talking about the story of the Road Warriors, you know, uh, he, was, uh, he was sharing with me some of the darker moments, you know, with Hawk and having to, um, you know, kind of, let's just put it this way. He had, to, he had to rescue Hawk out of a lot of very dire drug-related situations. I mean, obviously there's overdoses. But I'm talking like specific, you know, uh, going to very seedy parts of town <laughs> into, oh, sure. yeah. you know, uh, uh, maybe some condemned housing, you know, type situations and, and literally pulling him out of some of the most like it's straight out of a movie, like some of the most dire, you know, drug related situation you can imagine. And obviously he didn't want to go that heavy with it, knowing that, you know, Mike's family was involved and stuff, but just what he had to go through in order to maintain, you know, the fact that they're joined, they're in a band, if you will, together, you know, they're not, it's not just one wrestler who can go out and do his own thing and he's his own boss and the whole thing. It's, it's like you're in a band, you have a, you have a band and you get, you need to get your guitar player out of this, you know, out of this situation so we can perform and make money <laughs> and work, you know? Yeah. And it, uh, I just remember feeling like, oh my God, like this, the story and, and what animal has been through with, uh, you know, having to mind Hawk is wild, much wilder than he made it seem in the, in the show. Well, JP made reference to it already. And we've talked about it on a prior episode of Unheard, where we talked about Darren Drozdov participating in the LOD 2000 stable in the WWF during the Attitude Era. They came up with this storyline where Hawk was basically loaded on television walking around pretending he's drunk and with suicidal ideations. And there's a, there's a segment where he climbs on top of the big-ass screen they call the Titantron and falls off of it. It was a prop fall, of course. There was something to catch him, but the, the audience didn't see it. So it was almost like he drunkenly scaled this Titantron and fell to his death. And it was never really, the loop was never really closed as far as where the WWF scriptwriters were going with that idea. But it did come up in the course of your conversation with Animal. And uh, I always wondered how he felt about this. And, and he talked about it. Um, they're trying to channel Hawk's issues for this story. And um, another perspective Animal brings as he talks to you guys is it was actually him that was proposed at first to be the guy who would be the drunk in the scenario. Listen to this. They originally wanted me to do it. And I said, no, I can't. I'm not doing it. They said, why don't you want to do it, Joe? I said, well, because I want, you know what? I got one kid in high school. I got one kid in junior high. I got one kid in elementary school. And I'm not going to do that to my kids. I'm not, even though this is entertainment, I'm not going to have them be asked by fellow classmates, hey, why is your dad? Your dad's a drunk. Your dad's a drug head. Your dad's this, that, this, that. I'm not going to do that. And Hawk we had just come off a suspension, said, I will do it. And Hawk volunteered, which I thought was big of him 
took the pressure off me, but Hawkwind did it. But I think all in all, Vince wanted, I think at the time, I wouldn't say Vince personally, I think the WWE wanted Hawk to do it because it was kind of, for me, too close to home. The whole angle was too close to home. You know what I mean? I mean, he, he, he was already suspended for three or four times for substance abuse. And to get in there and portray that on TV, you know, in a real life situation was like, why are we doing this? And that's when the TV was going dark. You know, they talk, called it the dark era. That's when it was going dark. And Vince said, hey, man, he, he told us at a big meeting in the locker room, we're going dark. I didn't think we were going to go that dark to step over that line. To me, there's a line you can't cross. And we were crossing it big time. Yeah, can you imagine just all the the struggles, JP, that an animal went through <laughs> trying to corral Hawk on the road and deal with the things everyone was talking about, and then it just becomes fodder at the end. Just fodder. But but we have a situation where animal took a stand. I don't think people necessarily know that. And uh, Draws talked to Dark Side about how Ultimately, maybe it would have been a big break for him in his career because it was going to be revealed that he was the pusher. He was the supplier to Hawk that, that put him over the edge. Or if the initial <laughs> plans played out, it would have been Animal. It seems like the way Animal was talking there that basically they wanted it to be Hawk. They were channeling Hawk, but they were too sort of afraid to approach Hawk with the idea because of how on the nose it was. But they have to do it because once they have an idea like that, they have to scratch that itch. So they propose that Animal be the drunk is sort of like the uh, the twist on things and and uh, thankfully, to hear uh, Animal tell it, Hawk stepped up. Well, it was it was he was right in the money there because they were uh, making entertainment out of something that was all too real. And uh, Mike Hegstrand Hawk passed away on October nineteenth of two thousand three at the age of forty six of a heart attack. And uh, the moment is um, you know well explored and documented um, on the Dark Side episode about the the last ride of the Road Warriors. But here, uh, in a bit of tape that didn't make the final cut, Animal talks about receiving the word. Uh, that his great friend, dating back to Minneapolis, is his longtime superstar tag team partner. They traveled the world together, and the guy that he had to, you know, essentially babysit uh, through the final years of their career. Uh, he gets the word here that um, Hawk has has left the earth. It was one of the hardest things, man. I put down my pool vacuum. I sat on my stairs, and uh, I literally cried like a baby. I mean, that was my brother. That was my friend. I've been through thick and thin, through, through hell and back with this guy, right? And then now he's dead. And I'm thinking to myself, too, you know, whether it's selfish or not, shit, what am I going to do? We're the road warriors. No one's going to see the road warrior. I had that thought in my mind. Who's going to want to see the road warrior? How am I going to tell my kids that Hawk had passed away? What am I going to say? Now I'm going to have a million people asking me a million questions. What do I do, man? And it was just, it was probably one of the hardest things I ever had to go through. No different than when my mom or dad passed away, to be honest with you. You know, losing Hawk was, um, man, uh, when Hawk died, to be honest with you, a part of me died and the wrestling business died when Hawk died. So much passion, Evan, that he talked about Hawk with. And all of a sudden, it, it takes that turn where it's like, just so sad. I'll never forget uh, the experience of making this episode where you'd hear so many crazy, you know, funny, wild stories about Hawk. But then you'd also hear so many dark stories about Hawk. But at the end of the interview, you know, when, when you have to get to that point and you have to talk to these guys about losing their friend it was always like the most heartbreaking it was it was extra heartbreaking you know and i was not prepared for that in terms of what this episode would be like and i i, I won't forget the experience of when we interviewed paul ellering and he uh talks about he he uh recites from memory the eulogy that he said at hawk's funeral that was one of the most emotional, you know, uh, goosebumps, hair raise on your neck type moments during any of the interviews we've ever done. And again, just not something I would have expected, but everybody had such a deep emotional connection and fondness for, for Mike. Um, he was a very loved guy in terms of all of his peers and all of the, 
you know, guys he traveled up and down the road with, um, you know, and as wild and as crazy as he got and those far out fucking stories about him, it's they all really, really had an affection for him that was deep and very profound. And that comes through in that moment we just heard. And it definitely comes through in the episode, too. And as Animal went there in the interviews you just heard, his mind floated back to a moment where super stressed out dealing with Hawk, he he drew a line in the sand. This is at the tail end of their first WWF run, right before Hawk was fired, and and an animal here recalls the stress of attempting to right the path of the Road Warriors. Well, you know, man, I don't think anything really tore us apart where we would say, oh, God damn, I can't stand that guy. It never got like that. I think when it just got the time to draw the line in the sand, and listen, man, you're doing this, and I don't like that, you know, it was right after, you know, that Wembley Stadium show was pretty much, shit, I've had enough. That's it. Frick, I'm done with this. You know, and, and you know, and it's funny, man. I went back to the doctor a few times, you know, and the doctor said, man, you've had a little bit of heart issues and it had to do with the stress of all that stuff. And it was really stressful back then, man. I'm telling you, it was stressful as hell. Because, you know, you're worried about feeding your family and stuff. And, you know, and unfortunately, because of some of those antics, we lost out on millions of dollars of merchandise money because of that. Which is kind of, I hate it today because here we are, the greatest tag team of all time in the history of wrestling. And we lost out on so much. Such a great team were the Road Warriors, but they could have been so much greater. What was happening behind the scenes made them too much of a live wire to rely on and to program consistently. And and that's what, you know, treatments like the dark side treatment of the Road Warriors story bring forward are, are the invisible things that we as fans, especially kid fans, had no clue about. Just to us, we're sitting there wringing our hands like, where are our favorites, you know? And all these things are happening. And, and Evan, is, as I looked at that piece of sound and, and came across it on the transcript, what really stood out to me is how he's remembering the stress of dealing with Hawk was such that his heart doctor even pointed out that, you know, you're having a negative health effects from dealing with all this. I mean, that was all the way back. The story he mentioned there was back in 1992. The Wembley Stadium reference was the SummerSlam card where they wrestled in the opening match against Money Incorporated. And infamously, Hawk was in no condition to perform in the ring on that show. You can go back and watch it. And he's, you know, almost like falling asleep on the turnbuckle and really sloppy moving around the ring. Bret Hart talks about it in his book as well, and Animals talked about it before and, and on the episode. So when he mentioned the heart doctor, it just reminded me that, you know, we lost Joe Laurinaitis of a heart attack on September 20th of uh, 2020, uh, 10 days after his 60th birthday. Uh, so now both of the Road Warriors are gone. And this guy, Evan, that you talked to, that took you through, you know, being complete nobodies, just big muscle heads that didn't even know what they were doing in the TV studios to try to find their way with a look and trying to, to hit a stride, ended up catching fire like pretty much no other tag team we've ever seen in the United States, and then for it to just, just fall apart because of the excesses that introduced. It's, it's like an age-old story, but it's, it's uniquely sad when you realize that not only did Hawk meet the demise that you talked to Animal about, but, but Animal met a rather untimely demise ultimately as well. Yeah, I, I I remember when we when I, we were filming season three, uh, when we got the news of animals passing, and it was surreal because it, it wasn't. I want to say that it was maybe not even a year after that episode aired. I want to say, and uh, you know, Joe seemed in as good as health. You know, you would never suspect that there would. You know, obviously, you know that he was in any bad shape or anything. It just was so unexpected, at least for me, and I'm sure a lot of the fans. And um, and it was a shock. It was a total shock, and it was tough. It was it was a tough time because it was somebody like, you know, that we had. It felt like we had just been with, and then, but also being super grateful again that we were able to do this and how this came together. It really was a collaboration. It was it was like kind of working together with Joe to make this and and to do sort of a more honest look at their history and what he had gone through and his experiences. Um, it was shocking that, um, you know, he passed away so soon after doing that. And for an episode that you, you said, you know, toyed around with the idea of building it around Hawk, the idea that ends up being about the road warriors, you know, sort of soup to nuts in the final 
edit. It also ended up being, I think as we've also illustrated here on Dark Side of the Ring Unheard, animals testimonial to what it was like to be the guy trying to keep the ship above water as, uh, as Hawk did his thing and as they tried to um, you know, leverage to the hilt the, the electricity they were able to create. Almost a byproduct of just their natural charisma um, more than anything else in, in the wrestling ring. So that is the story of the Road Warriors and a similar uh, journey ahead as uh, Dark Side of the Ring returns to Vice TV on Tuesday night with a treatment on the life of Terry Gordy, uh, a similarly celebrated wrestler and all-around tremendous talent who passed away very soon and had a very tragic and slow decline to that day uh, where a lot of uh, potential kind of went up in, in smoke um, d- due to the aforementioned issues he tackled. So a uh, page perhaps from the same tragic book in the wrestling business, uh, Terry Gordy, coming up Tuesday night on Vice TV, Dark Side of the Ring. For now, for us, it's back to the vault, ladies and gentlemen. We want to thank you for joining us on this episode of Dark Side of the Ring Unheard, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.